Good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to the final day of the 23rd Poetry Memorial Lecture Series. In today's lecture, the relationship between gravitation and quantum gravity will be put forward and illustrated by a thought experiment. The talk will end with a discussion on the current status of this topic. I request, sir, to please come and speak. I request everyone to please switch off their mobile phones. Before I start, I just showed you this picture of the double slit experiment, which is taken in the lab for uh, two parts of here. So you can see that there are two leg scales involved. One is a fine leg scale that corresponds to the separation between the two slits, and one is a longer leg scale that corresponds to the size of the two slits. So a double slit experiment is basically giving you the Fourier transform of the slit plane. Mathematically, that's what's happening. And there are two leg scales involved. The sizes of the slits, which is usually referred to as diffraction, and the distance separation of the slits, which is referred to as h fields. And you can see both the leg scales here. I just wanted to show you this, because to let you know that there's a real experiment which we are really talk, which we're talking about. So last time I couldn't quite finish the talk, I spent it again, so I'll just go back. Yeah, we went over the idea that many things which were absolute in theory of physics become relative. So the first notion that we encountered was time. Time was the same for everybody. Or rather, time differences were the same for everybody in Newton in physics. But then when we get to relativity, we uh, realize that time depends on the observer. No two people have the same time unless they have exactly the same world line. So normally the differences are very small, and we tend to ignore them. But you know from quantum mechanics that time is related to other things. For example, the conjugate variable to time is energy. From that you realize that energy is also frame dependent. And in particular, radiation is also a frame dependent notion. And many of the things that are confusing about radiation in GR, which I talked about last time, can be understood from the fact that every frame sees different physics. Although there is actually something that, that is the same, there are some things which are the same for all observers, many things are different. So the same electromagnetic fields, which may be described as radiation by a uh, Minkowski observer, will be described as a Coulomb field by a Rindler observer. We went over this diagram last time. We went over the Rindler picture last time. Now I want to just say in one word what we do in quantum field. Many of you have studied quantum mechanics. And there are endless discussions in the class about wave particle duality. And I think far too much time is spent on what is mysterious about quantum mechanics. So when we get to quantum field theory, we write down operators which depend on space and time. And it's split up in the following way. There is a sum over all the modes. Usually the plane waves are the modes which are used. And we have an expansion that looks like this. I'm just writing this down for impressionistic reasons. But the attitude we take in quantum field theory is that the fields themselves become operators. But we expand those operators in terms of uh, creation and destruction operators. This is creation and that's destruction. And there are some mode functions. 
Now, this neatly divides up the two notions of wave and particle into, into two parts. And it's, uh, if you look at the modes, they correspond to the waves. And the operators which create and destroy correspond to the particles. You think of each mode as being behaving like a wave. But the particles are represented by the presence or absence of, I mean, the age decide whether or not there's a particle present in that particular mode. Yeah? So this is the action we take in quantum field theory that we take the modes and expand the fields in terms of the modes, and then basically look at these as the quantum mechanical operators. This might be a little high for some of you, but let's go on. And uh, basically, each mode is a harmonic oscillator. It's no harder from than what you studied in your quantum mechanics course. OK, we also talked about the Riddler horizon last time. We had the feature that looks like this. We put CT over here and X here, and the light goes like this. And you have a family of observers who are uniformly accelerating. <laughs> now, you notice that events which are in these, this passes of space-time are not accessible to these observers. So if I send a light signal from here, or burst a cracker here, this guy will never see it, because he comes in from here, and he goes out there, and he can only see one half of the space-time. So in the first lecture, there was a question from somewhere over there. Somebody asked, is it true that every event is accessible to every other observer? And at that time, my answer was yes, because in flat space and with inertial observers, it's really true. No matter which, where the event happens, an inertial observer will eventually get to see that event. Whereas here, we're talking about accelerated frames, and it's no longer true. And we come across the notion somewhat like the event horizon of a black hole. You can not see a certain set of events, and this is called the regular horizon. Yeah. Now let's uh, talk about black holes. This is an example of something that looks like a black hole, except that the area of this guy is infinite. Because if you put in the y and the z coordinates, this is really a plane, and there's a lot of area in a plane. So a black hole is something which is more physically realistic than the real space time. And all astronomers would agree that there are black holes in the universe. So given the fact that there are black holes in the universe, let's consider how it affects the ideas of what it is. So last time, somebody over here brought up uh, the first law of thermodynamics. And I want to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. So consider what happens if we give it a black hole. I've been emphasizing the idea that we should construct experiments, or at least thought experiments. It's very difficult to make a black hole on the planet because it's inconveniently large. You need a lot of mass to make a black hole. But there do exist black holes, and we can imagine in the future having a black hole to experiment with. So here's a possible experiment that you might do. Well, we've been looking at everything from the point of view of Doppler shifts. Right? Now, suppose a, an observer has a, This might be a little annoying because I've been talking about Doppler shifts and making some <coughs> irritating noise as well. But some. Here's the first one. This is a fixed 2 kilohertz signal in the rest frame of one observer. So it sounds like this. Okay? Yeah. So suppose you have one observer who's sitting outside the black hole and another one who's falling in. And the guy who's falling in is given the same device, the thing that makes a 2 kilohertz signal. For example, he could be taking this computer and falling in. Let's assume that, that there is air or something like that. This is what would be seen by an observer who's outside the black hole. Firstly, you can see that the frequency is redshifted. 
That's a combination of two effects. In fact, both effects we've been talking about. When the guy falls in, he's moving with a certain velocity and he's going into a gravitational field. So you get both the gravitational redshift as well as the velocity Doppler shift. With the consequence that the frequency keeps getting lower and lower. Finally, it goes so low that you cannot hear it anymore. And there's a finite time after which you don't see the guy even. I mean, you won't be able to get any signals from this guy. We've escaped. <laughs> <laughs> So just for fun, I'm going to show these people the same thing again. This is an irritating sound that represents a 2 kilohertz signal. And this is the same signal as seen from the outside of a black hole where one observes others falling in. That's what it sounds like. to violate the laws. That's, I've been telling you always, you should try to make problems. Whenever you have an idea, you should try to convert the idea into a problem. So here's a problem for you. I know that the second law of thermodynamics tells me that entropy in the world always decreases. <laughs> yeah. So I'm glad that you're doing <laughs> So let's consider taking a bag full of entropy, going to a black hole and dropping it in. Right? Then the black hole is going to keep that, that entropy locked up there and the entropy of the rest of the universe decreases. Right? And so it looks like you have a conflict between the second law of thermodynamics and the laws of black hole physics. Because if you can throw entropy into a black hole, you can make the universe less disordered and decrease the, law, the entropy of the rest of the universe. The only way out of this is to say that perhaps the black hole itself has entropy, and it has to be, yeah, it has to be an entropy which is an increasing function of energy. In other words, the, if I were to plot the S entropy as a function of the mass of the energy of the black hole, it would be a function that it increasing like that. Is that clear? Because if the entropy was decreasing, this won't solve the problem. If you have an entropy which is decreasing with energy, the matter that you throw in will go to increase the mass of the black hole. And if the entropy decreases, that is still a problem. You must have an entropy that increases with energy if we have to solve this problem of violation of the second law of thermodynamics. Now that immediately gives us an interesting fact. You know from thermodynamics that this equation is true, that the inverse temperature is given by the derivative of the entropy with respect to the energy. So if this quantity is positive, it means that the temperature of a black hole is also positive. So very simple argument is that, that there's a connection between black hole physics and thermal physics, which you did not anticipate when we started out. Is this point clear? Yeah? So we know that any body which is at a temperature T is going to radiate. And that radiation is called Morphic radiation. I give, I've given you a very simple argument for it, but there's a more detailed argument using the physics of quantum field theory that will give you exactly the same result. That a body will radiate at a temperature which is called the Hawking temperature. And this is equal to the what we call the surface gravity of a black hole. And that's defined in the following way. Suppose you have a black hole here, and you take a mass, and you have a long pulley like this and you sit at infinity and put a weight here. I mean, this is on the Earth, let's say. They're on the Earth now. If you want to keep this body static here, you have to have a force per unit mass of G. So that quantity is called the surface gravity. And the temperature of the black hole is just given by, I think it is G over 2 pi, in some units, where you put H bar, and C equal to 1, and G also equal to 1. Maybe this is a little confusing, but most relativists, when they decide that space and time are the same, they put C equal to 1, that's this quantity, 
And when you do quantum mechanics, you also put h bar equal to 1. And uh, when you get to quantum gravity, you put g equal to 1. These are called natural units. They were first discussed by Planck, who was very excited when he realized that fundamental constants seem to define everything in nature. You're talking on Boltzmann constant. Sorry. Yeah, actually, yeah, I don't want Boltzmann constant because I tell you, Boltzmann, um, just as I said in the first lecture, which, were you here? Yeah, you were here. I was claiming that, uh, that, uh, yeah, that quantum mechanics is dishonest. I'm going to claim to you that Boltzmann is dishonest. <laughs> because if you measure temperature in energy units, there is no Boltzmann constant. So it's a something which you can eliminate. So fundamentally, there are these three constants. And it's true. But the idea that you're making an important point, and the point is that when we start putting together gravitation with thermodynamics, one of the things that naturally comes up is thermal physics. And we have got statistical mechanics coming for free, although we did not put it in the beginning. All we put in in the beginning was quantum fluctuations and gravitation. But Hawking's work shows us that we are also getting into thermal physics and statistical mechanics. That's an important point. Yeah? But uh, I would like to just uh, only measure temperature in energy units, which is what Landon Lipschitz always do. And so then this Boltzmann constant has been put to one. In a sense, that's one way of thinking. So is, is this part point clear? This is uh, relatively what we call so I told you last time that the accelerator observers, the regular observers, see the Minkowski vacuum as a thermal bar. So even the vacuum, the notion of a vacuum is frame dependent. When some person thinks that there's a vacuum, that there's no particles there, somebody else would think that there are particles there, and in fact it's a thermal bar of particles. This is called the unruled effect, and it's a flat space version of the Hawking effect. And just before this I was talking to Abhinav Gupta, and he was telling me that, well, there's a simple argument for this, which involves Doppler shift. We know that in quantum mechanics, the uncertainty principle tells us that delta T delta E is of the order of H bar. Now, that means that you can violate energy con conservation for short pieces of time, for short uh, durations of time. And so you can spontaneously produce electron-positron pairs, for example, from the vacuum. But they will only last for a time, which is given by the uncertainty principle. The delta T will be h bar on 2 mc squared, because that's the kind of energy violations you need to have. But if you do such a spontaneous creation over here, and then you translate it into what would be seen here, a person looking from here will see those particles as being very long lived. Because the Doppler effect will take a small time here and make it a huge time over there. So if I trace back, lines from here, I mean, if I trace back the lines of constant time from here, a small time here becomes a huge time there. So what looks like a very small time for an inertial observer here becomes a very long time there. So these particles are very long lived and they're very real. So the reality of particles changes when you go from frame to frame. This point has been made earlier. Okay, now I'll get to my lecture problem, today's lecture. Yeah, actually, this is based on work published in Classical and Quantum Gravity last year. And uh, what I've tried to do in these lectures is to combine my research interests with the idea of popularization. So we started with elementary things like special and general relativity, but I would like to get you to this point. And this is a place where the level is considerably higher, but I think that is the idea behind the lectures which are named after Popley, to start from elements and get up to something like the research level. So I posed this question earlier, what is the relation between these two theories? We are all convinced that this theory is well described by general relativity and this by quantum field theory. But these don't seem to fit together as well as they do. And we should regard this as a challenge and an opportunity rather than a problem. Because it always happens when there's tension between two physical theories which are each valid in their own domain that you can learn something more. This happened at the end of the last century when there was tension between Newtonian mechanics and electrodynamics. 
which is what led to the special theory of relativity. So normally we think of gravity as operating in the large, that is to say, when you have planets scattering off each other, that is gravity, or when you have black holes merging together, or when you have cosmology, that's the domain of gravitation. And normally we think of quantum changes acting in the small, in the large hadron collider, in dots, in your mobile phones where the transistors work according to the principles of quantum mechanics. So normally there's not much of an overlap, but from the point of view of the unity of physics, we can, cannot let these theories be separate. They have to be merged into something, and there probably is a harmonious coexistence of these two theories it's when we understand what's going on. So one approach is what they call quantum gravity. So this approach uh, studies new theories which agree with relativity for low energies, but which are different from gen general relativity when one gets to higher energies and smaller length scales. I guess all of you know that when I talk about high energy, I mean small length scale, and low energy is a long length scale. That relation is clear. So the, th the, th the approaches which explore the short distance behavior of gravity, we call them quantum gravity approaches. And examples of these are string theory, which believes that all the fundamental particles are vibrations of a string. There's another approach called loop quantum gravity. This is an area in which I've worked, but I no longer do. It's an area where they try to apply the principles of quantum mechanics in a straightforward way to general activity, what they call the Hamiltonian formulation. There are other less uh, well-known approaches. This is pioneered by Raphael Sorkin, who's at Syracuse, just like the originator of this theory, Abhay Hashtaker, and non-commutative geometry. These are just names, and I won't spend any more time on that. The trouble with all these approaches is that there's really no experimental guidance, because the experiments are all at a very high scale, far above the large hadron collider scale. The only guides we have are eternal consistency, which is absolutely necessary for a theory, and aesthetics. <coughs> and aesthetics is a very subjective matter, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So there's not much agreement between people on which of these theories is more beautiful and which is less. So there's no consensus about the right approach to quantum gravity. An alternate strategy <coughs> is to just take the theories we already have, the ones that we are convinced about, that is quantum field theory and general activity and push them to confront each other with thought experiments. That's the approach I take here. That is, just let's understand what we already have. So I'm going to reverse the emphasis of the last slide. Instead of the short distance behavior of gravity, I study the long distance behavior of quantum theory. So rather than look at gravity through a microscope, let's look at quantum theory through a telescope. We can do both, do it both ways. Now, quantum mechanics is generally considered to be a very confusing theory, and Feynman has emphasized this in, in many places. It's physically realized in the double slit experiment, and mathematically the linear structure of Hubert space. All the troubles come from something called the superposition principle. So it's the idea that if one state is allowed, and another state is also allowed, an arbitrary linear combination of these two is also allowed. So given two states of quantum mechanics, you can superpose them. It's absolutely fundamental to quantum mechanics. But it's also very disturbing to a classical physicist for reasons that I will explain. It's been described by yeah, the, the, the double slit experiment, which I showed you right at the beginning, has been described by Feynman as the only mystery of quantum physics. If you understand that, you basically disentangle quantum physics. So let me just explain what the problem is and what the mystery is. Suppose you have a source here and you have two slides. And you can do four different experiments. You can work with the first slit open and the second one closed. <laughs> and you see a certain pattern. And you can do it the other way around. Well, you can close both the slits, then you'll see nothing out there. That's one of the four experiments. Another one, you can do it one slit open, the other closed. And the third one, you do with this one open and that one closed. 
and finally you can have both together. When you do these four experiments, you find that the probability of arrival at a given point here, P, let's say, it has a rather, rather, rather strange behavior. According to Feynman, you can calculate this by summing over all possible paths to get from there. You find that the probability of arriving here when you have one slit open, which I call u of s1, and the probability of arrival when you have the other slit open, which is u2, is not the same as the probability when you have both slits open. In other words, this quantity is not zero, and this is generally the independence term. This is the rapidly oscillating feature that you saw. Now, this is completely at variance with classical ideas of probability theory. If you look at classical probabilities, if I throw a die, the probability of getting one on the die is something. The probability of getting two on the die is something else. If I throw a die and ask, what's the, I'll bet on either one or two coming up. I'll expect the probabilities to add. That's not happening here. So quantum probabilities behave in a different way from classical probabilities. So this is something we have to understand. How does the classical world and the attended probabilities emerge from the quantum world? And it's way of looking at probability. So there must be some way in which the interference is an effect that disappears from macroscopy in, under some conditions. And in fact, when Thomas Young first did the double state experiment, he gave a very deep, a lot of thought to this. Why did we see interference all the time? And he came up with some conditions. But let, let me explain what, what is really bothering about this. If you talk about classical light waves, for example, this experiment I showed, showed you was done with classical light waves. You have a source here, and light waves go through. We know that waves go through both states. That's OK. I don't have a problem with that. The problem comes when I turn down the intensity of the light. And I've got single photons going through. We have the picture that single photons are particles. And they would have to go through either this or that. But actually, they seem to go through both. So when you talk about probability waves, this notion becomes more problematic than we talk about water waves or electromagnetic waves. So when we work at the single photon level or the single electron level, which is an experiment which is often done, we have a problem getting the classical intuition to mesh with the quantum facts. The probabilities of exclusive events don't seem to add up in quantum physics. So here's another picture. And I said before that Python has described this as the only mystery of quantum physics. What I'm doing here is an electron experiment, let's say. So here's the source. This is the separation between the slits. This distance translates into the fine wiggles over here. And ignore the red and the blue line. And we see that P, with both the probability of arrival at a given point here, with both the slits open, is not the sum of the two probabilities. I should also add that Feynman has this beautiful way of looking at quantum mechanics. When you take the the amplitude, which is the square root of the probability, to go from the source to the detector, to be a sum over all parts of a phase. And this we write down as the classical action. Last time somebody brought up the action. That's an advanced notion from classical mechanics. And for a relativistic particle, the classical action is just mc times the total time that you go from here to there. That's relativistic. And if you have electromagnetic theory, this gets modified by a factor, which is E A U D H P. If this is not familiar, I can explain that. I mean, you have an extra phase that comes in if you have an electric charge and an electromagnetic field. And I'll also make another, take another precaution. Make sure that the electrons are highly non-relativistic because I don't want to create particles which will confuse the experiment. That's avoiding, avoiding what they call the client paradox. <coughs> now, when we get to relativity, the principle of equivalence tells us that gravity can be replaced by acceleration. For example, a Grindler observer with uniform acceleration feeds a gravitational field. We've been over this before, that the polar coordinates in geometry are circles and circles have constant curvature. And they're described by trigonometric functions. The Rinder observers are described. Yeah, yeah, what, what, 
what will happen is that all the information which has gone here, yep. he will be able to read, exactly. see it again. When he, but it will be highly blue shifting because when he, right, whatever he saw. Because in black hole information, the paradox one of the resolving it is that black holes evaporate and then information can be recovered. Yeah. So in this case, also perhaps it can be covered. So finally, I think the whole theory has to be military, but in an effective exactly. sense, it's not military. In an effective sense. to the case of the electron. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, so you have these two slits, mm -hmm. uh, Young's double slit experiment. Mm -hmm. The electron uh, uh, produces an interference pattern. Yeah. Um, now, uh, because it couples to the photon bar yes. at uh, room temperature, say, mm -hmm. um, the photon bar is going to cause decoherence. And you had certain length scale of the separation between the two slits. Yes, yes. Right? That if the temperature of the photon bar is 300, mm -hmm. then there is a certain length scale um, such that if the slits are further apart, yes, yes, right. um, then um, you will not see the interference yeah, pattern. Yeah, this is the length scale, it's what you would keep it. Right. So, uh, and this turns out to be for electrons. Uh, so, this is. Uh, this for electrons. This is, okay. Um, I and mean, this is this is this this independent of the mass. This is independent of the mass, yes. But the mass comes in the coupling constant. If, if you're talking about gravitational decoherence, yes. Yeah, here it depends. It's independent of the mass. It is. Uh, it depends on the separation of the slits, and it depends on the charge, the coupling constant. So uh, whether one does it with electrons or with protons, yes. it's the same length scale. Yeah. Right. The experiment. Right. I mean, as far as this length scale is concerned, yes. same experiment. Uh, because it depends upon the coupling, both couple in the same way to the photons, and therefore that's what happens. Okay. Now, um, in the case of the um, neutral particle, coupling to the gravitational bar, um, there is a similar length scale that you have, right? That's right. Right? And um, maybe you can just say I think that, scale, that length scale is the same, but what changes when you get to gravity is the fact that this one thing depends on the mass. The coupling depends on that. So will that reflect uh, in the length scale here or not? No, the length scale is the same, but the effectiveness of the decoder is dependent also on this factor, which was earlier e squared by h bar c, now it is g h squared upon h bar c. I see. So there, uh, in the electromagnetic case, it would depend upon the charge of the particle. Yes. Which was e, yeah. both for protons and electrons. And here it would depend upon the masses. Yeah. So I showed two graphs mm. for the electromagnetic case. One was when the charge was uh, one, you know, when the charge was three, yes. and the decoder was, was faster. Was faster. Yes. yes. Okay. So now, um, supposing one took a massive particle, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, ordinary particle, not an elementary particle, yeah. but let's say uh, a macroscopic particle of uh, mass ten to the minus five grams, right? Um, and try to do interference with that, right? So, um, what would fail for that? I mean, you know, in that case, we should see, uh, you know, uh, effects of uh, because the particle is massive enough. Yes, right. Should one therefore be able to see the effects of decoherence due to yes. gravity yeah, yeah, if, if one, uh, uh, you know, works with massive enough particles? Yes. Yeah. So why can't one do it with, let's say, um, you know, nanoparticles or uh, or other particles, right? right. Or uh, you know, which have more macroscopic, so to speak. So what? what that's certainly what one would like to do. For example, one could take buckyballs and do it if it's yes. such things have been done. Mm -hmm. But it's still not at the Planck mass level. People are still doing interference experiments with much smaller masses than that. Yes, but you know, uh, we can uh, have microscopic particles. I mean, we can have particles which have that. Right. right. Well, I think the challenge there would be because this large particle also has the hyperbolic functions and they have constant acceleration, just as the circles have constant curvature. So here's a picture of a real observer going from here to there. And what I'm going to suggest is we can do experiments both in the Minkowski space and in the space of the real observer and see what happens with the double slit experiment. So we've already been over this. The Unruh effect is a frame dependent notion. And the separation of uh, fields into Coulomb and Venetian is also frame dependent. The ring observer sees a Minkowski vacuum as a thermal bar. I mean, the same quantum state, which to the Minkowski observer looks like 
empty, at least to the reader observer as a thermal bar. So let's try to understand what happens if we have this experiment done in a thermal bar. Before we go there, I have to address these two questions, which I promised you earlier. Some people ask, is the Arnoux effect real? And has it been seen experimentally? Let's spend some time on these two. So the Arnoux effect is basically taking flat space quantum field theory and look at, looking at it in an accelerated frame. Now, flat space quantum field theory has been tested to fantastic accuracy. For example, as I told you before, the anomalous magnetic moment of the electron has been measured to nine decimal places. And the same quantity has been calculated from 10 to 12 places. And when we look at better and better experiments, we find that the next place just agrees with this one. So there's no doubt that quantum field theory in flat space cells are perfectly good theory. Now I'd like to take an analogy. Suppose we look at Newtonian gravity, and we know that it, in an inertial frame, it describes the planetary motion perfectly. Now what happens when you go to a non-inertial frame? There's going to be a new force, the Coriolis force. So do, do we need to check it experimentally? I would say no, because we already know that the, in the inertial frame, the physics works perfectly. All we're doing is going to a new frame and carrying over the new physics to the non-inertial frame. In the same way, the successes of quantum field theory tell us that the Arnoux effect is equally real. Just as the Coriolis force will appear, the Arnoux effect will appear when you go to a non inertial frame. We don't need to separately, experimentally test this. Of course, it would be good to test it, but logically it's not really necessary to <coughs> test it separately. And let me just say that there are many people trying to test the Arnoux effect. There are two methods in which they do it. They go to quantum systems which have got fluids in them, superfluids in them. Another good trick is that the reason the effect is so hard to test is that the speed of light is very large. C is large. So instead of the speed of light, they look at analog systems where the speed of light is replaced by the speed of sound. And they're looking for analog unruh effects in those systems. Has it been seen experimentally? Well, not yet, but I expect one day it will be. Not too far. Away. Now, there's an old idea due to Penrose, DOC, and actually it's even older. It goes back to Feynman at the Chapel Hill Conference in North Carolina in 1957. So here's a quote from uh, proceedings of that conference. Feynman says, I would like to suggest that it's possible that quantum mechanics fails at large distances and for large objects. It is not inconsistent with what we do know. If this failure of quantum mechanics is connected with gravity, we might speculatively expect this to happen for masses such that this combination is 1, or n is near 10 to minus 5 grams. That is Feynman's uh, speculation. This idea has been pursued by other people, and the standard approach is within Newtonian gravity. So these three people suggest that what happens to quantum mechanics is most of the time, it follows the Schrodinger equation, which is which looks like this. But every so often, whenever we perform measurements, there's a collapse of the wave function, and that happens spontaneously and randomly. I find this very unsatisfactory because you have one theory when you're <coughs> measuring and a different theory when you're not measuring. Right? But that's the theory that these people talk about. It's called spontaneous collapse. And as far as I know, there's no experimental support for this idea. So in quantum mechanics, you can come up with superpositions of arbitrary macroscopic states. For example, we could have superpositions of uh, a cat being both dead and alive. That's called Schrodinger's cat. It's a very famous paradox. And the collapse postulate is something which is at variance with the Schrodinger equation. Because this equation is unitary, it preserves probabilities in quantum mechanics, but its collapse is something non unitary But this is the Copenhagen interpretation, and it's been very much used and very, very successful in some sense of the term in relating the theory to the experiment. So it seems to me arbitrary to suggest that there's stochastic spontaneous collapse because they're invoking new stuff, and there's no, it seems ad hoc, which is a Latin phrase 
that probably means something, but it means you know you're just doing it without any reason. And they're also working within Newtonian gravity and non-relativistic quantum mechanics. I would suggest that what we need is a relativistic approach, and that's the approach I'm taking. So let's consider this experiment again, and this time this is the same picture I had earlier. This time you can pay attention to these these blue and red lines here. So the idea here is that I'm doing this experiment, but I like to do it in thermal part. That is, I do the experiment at finite temperature, which is actually the way most experiments are done. Let's do the double slit experiment with electrons in a double bath, which is about 300 degrees, which is room temperature. What do you expect to see? So suppose, for instance, the temperature was very low, then the mean wavelength of the photons would cover both the slits. Yeah? And the two, oh, I'm, yeah, I've probably gotten ahead of myself. Yeah, so I come back to that slide. I can construct, uh, I can think of two experiments. One I call E1 and the second I call E2. The first one is the double slit experiment in a thermal environment. And the second one is the double slit experiment in an accelerated frame. We know that the accelerated frame also has a thermal environment, even when there's no particles around as far as the Minkowski observer is concerned. I'll analyze both experiments using only known physics, and I find in E1 that thermal fluctuations of the electromagnetic field cause decoherence of the electron double slit experiment. And for E2, the vacuum fluctuations of the inertial observer appear thermal to the Rindler observer, and once again, there's loss of coherence. In other words, that we don't have coherence, the presence of coherence is destroyed by acceleration or by temperature. So you can do the analysis mathematically as well as physically. And the mathematical analysis is there in my paper. But I'm going to just talk about the physical part now. <coughs> Let's talk about the, what happens when you have a thermal part of photons. This is an argument very similar to the Heisenberg microscope, which you might have already come across in your quantum mechanics course. So if you go back to this diagram, a blue photon has enough momentum to knock this particle from a dark spot into a, uh, from a bright spot into a dark spot and wash out the interference pattern. A red photon does not have. So if your temperature is very small, in a very precise sense that they will come to now, then you will find that the interference pattern stays. As you keep increasing the temperature, when the wheel wavelength of the radiation becomes of the same size as the slit separation, then you find that the interference pattern is destroyed. So what does that mean for us in the lab? Normally we do experiments with electron uh, interference, and the separation between the slits is about one micrometer. Now, the laboratory temperature, T, is about 300 degrees Kelvin. And that corresponds to a wheel wavelength, that's the maximum of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is around 20 microns. So what this argument says is that if I keep increasing the separation between the slits, when it gets to about 20 microns, you lose the interference pattern. That's a very clear prediction from this, from this theory. So here it is in a different way. When I look at the electric field correlations between the, when I look at the correlations of the electric field between different points of space, the electric field correlations die out at a range, rate which is given by e to the minus x minus x prime upon wind wavelength, where this is the precise expression for the wind wavelength. It goes inversely as the temperature. So if I have a very low temperature, the electromagnetic field fluctuations in front of the two slits are correlated. So you don't lose the interference pattern. But if you go far away, they're uncorrelated, and you lose the interference pattern. It's like having, uh, take the double slit experiment that you did with light, and put some kind of fluctuation in the refractive index. For example, you could light a candle under one slit. That would be fluctuating independently of the other slit. That's going to wash out the pattern. Whereas if you put something which is correlated between the two slits, you will still see the interference pattern. So this tells you that at 20 microns separation, you should lose the interference pattern. 
and it can be made very precise by a mathematical algorithm, which I will not go into. Basically, it involves looking at the Wilson loop. The Wilson loop is basically given, yeah, given a path, given any path in space or space time. You can consider this total magnetic flux that goes through it. That what is called the Wilson loop. And what we are working out is the thermal average, thermal expectation value of the Wilson loop. It's a very easy calculation, and it's there in the paper in the appendix. It uses the methods of quantum field theory. But the answer is quite simple. It looks like this. The average of the Wilson loop is given by the exponential of this quantity here is the fine structure constant, e squared upon h bar c. That's about 1, one over 137. And then there's a, some quantity that depends on the temperature and the frequency of the mode. This is kBT then. And this alpha here is a quantity that's related to the size of the loop. It's called the form factor of the loop. It's essentially the Fourier transform of the loop. And it comes over here. So what it means is that if I plot the expectation value of the Wilson loop, you can show that that's the same as the fringe visibility. Fringe vis visibility is defined as I max minus I min divided by I max plus I min. That quantity turns out to start out at 1 for small separations, and then it slowly decays to 0. And the decay, uh, the two curves here correspond to different sizes of the coupling constant. In one case, I assume that the coupling constant was the same as E. In the second case, it was 3 times E. So it goes as E squared. So the coherence dies out much faster. So what is actually happening is that you're starting with the state which is pure, and it finally becomes impure, because when you have probabilities of arriving in one slit and the other slit, without any coherences between them, that's an impure state in quantum mechanics. And where's the information going? It's being carried away by the photons. A photon can carry away information, no matter what its frequency is. Even a soft photon is as good at carrying away information as a hard photon. So the photons which are carrying away the information have a wavelength which is similar to the separation of the space. So what I've done is to give you a simple model for gravity induced code decoherence, which is different from what, uh, of what many of the people who follow Penrose, Slimini, and Weber were talking about. It's different because this is relativistic. It uses the fact that massless particles can carry away information as radiation, and you never see the, the radiation after that. I mean, we can look for it, but we'll come back to that one later. Now, the Einstein equivalence principle relates gravity to acceleration, and this also means that gravity can cause decoherence, because the same effects of acceleration are also caused by gravity. This is consonant with Feynman, Penrose, DSC. And we expect similar decoherence effects for static observers outside the event horizon of a black hole. If you try to do the double state experiment outside a black hole, there would be Hawking radiation, which would be as bad as the thermal radiation here. Yeah. Now, does it happen? Well, the way I've explained it so far, we're only talking about charged particles. And that's because I decided to talk about charged particles since electromagnetism is something very familiar to everybody. And that's what I've been talking about. But what about neutral particles? Neutral particles don't couple to the electromagnetic field. So is, there the, is the coherence destroyed? What would destroy the coherence of neutral particles? Well, gravitation is universal, and everything couples to gravitation. So any mass will have to couple to the gravitation field. So if you replace electromagnetism with gravity, we find the answer to Feynman's question. Gravity decoherence quantum systems in the same way, and the effect is larger for larger systems and more strongly coupled ones. And the reason this works is that both gravity and electromagnetism are gauge theories in the sense that they both depend on the idea of parallelism. That is, you can move vectors in gravity from there to there and move them around and they'll have. They will not agree with their initial starting point. Similarly, in electrodynamics, the Wilson loop is a measure of the lack of parallelism of the theory. Such theories are called gauge theories. There's a difference between the two theories, like one of them is nonlinear and non-abelian, that's gravity, <coughs> whereas electromagnetism is linear and abelian. 
For weak fields, this does not really matter. And the expression for the form factor is, is uh, slightly different, but pretty much the same. And I'll show you what it looks like shortly. Now, is the loss of unitarity real or is it apparent? You can take three points of view. One point of view is from Gelbio's dialogue. There's a guy called Simplicio who takes a simple point of view. He sees the experiment and you've lost the coherence. So what he will say is that I don't care about those photons. I'll just look at the, what I can see. And he will decide that there is a loss of coherence in the system. A slightly more fundamentalist point of view would come from Sagredo. He would say, Sagredo is a religious guy who believes that you know, God takes care of everything. So according to him, the loss of coherence here is because of the information which has lost to the soft photons. He would say, I collect all that information together. And between them, I will still have unitary evolution. And Sagosio will roughly agree with him that both points of view are correct. If you ignore the photons which have been scattered from your experiment, you've lost unitarity. But if you don't ignore it, you have retained unitarity. But look what happens in the case of the Rinder observer. In the rest wing of the Rinder observer, he cannot access those photons which have been lost because they go behind the horizon. So you have genuine loss of unitarity as far as the Rinder observer is concerned. So unitarity looks like it's also frame dependent. I'd like to emphasize that this model uses only known physics. I've not put in anything which is different from the laws of quantum field theory. And suppose you replace electromagnetism with gravity. You find the answer to find. So all I've done here is to replace E squared by H bar C, damage the new with GM upon H bar C. And you find that this is the formula for the loss of coherence for a massive particle. Now this formula is interesting because unlike most formulae, it has many things in it. And it's, well, it's got the gravitational constant, which is, represents gravity. It's got Clamp's constant, which represents the quantum mechanics. It has C over here, which represents relativity, and T here, and Boltzmann's constant, which represents statistical mechanics. So it's got practically all the fundamental constants in it, and it's telling you how coherence goes down as you change the, any of these parameters. And you can also see that decoherence sets in when n is around the Planck mass, exactly as Feynman anticipated. That's when this quantity becomes of order 1. If I put this to 1, I find the formula for the Planck mass. That is 10 to the minus 5 times. So if you're doing interference experiments with particles, this is telling you that you can't really have uh, coherence once the particles get more massive than the Planck mass. Fluctuates. So the entropy increase is caused by virtual fluctuations, and in all cases, the sorry. In all cases, the entropy increase is caused by tracing over some unobserved degrees of freedom, either ones that go beyond the horizon or ones that we choose to ignore. And in some sense, there's something to do with the renormalization group here. We're only interested in the low energy physics. We're not interested in, we're integrating out degrees of freedom in some systematic way. When we say we are ignoring degrees of freedom. So it looks like the theory of gravitation along with quantum mechanics results in something that has got non-equilibrium statistical physics. So that's really the end of this talk. I think I've finished the end of time. Okay, we can have some questions. If so, I was wondering what if we did a similar interference experiment with photons? Now? Yes, yes. So, now there would still be a thermal bar, but of charged particles, but since there's a mass gap. Uh, so, sorry, uh, you're doing the experiment with photons. The photons yeah, are. Yeah, right, right. So, so, now your sources are photons, but yes. of course, photons won't scatter off photons. So, so, so there is a thermal bar. No, no, but then uh, they will have scatter of gravity. 
So for neutral particles, no, no, for charged no. particles, you have a coupling between the charge no. and photons. No, no, no. So, so here the argument is that let's say you demonstrate experiment there's a gravity that's outside the horizon. Yes. So then you see a thermal flux. Yes. And then you do it with, uh, do it with electrons, then there is already a photon bar. Yes. Right? And the photons, the soft photons carry away the gravitation and you have to, uh, in which you, if, if you, uh, in, since the, uh, the horizon blocks, uh, the soft photons away from you, there's no way to access that yes. information. Right? Yeah. But what if now, uh, so there is a certain order of decoherence here. Mm -hmm. But now that you say that if I have photons, <coughs> let's, have photons. Uh, let's have photons, and now you're saying they would scatter up gravity. Right. No, so but, 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 but then that would be a much smaller order. That's right? true. So as a matter of principle, it's there. So because gravity is much weaker than electromagnetism, the kind of decoherence that you get is much less. It is set at a much bigger scale. That's absolutely no, right. It's except that there would also be a thermal flux of charged particles, right? Except that, uh, yes. but, but, but because there's a mass gap, yeah. unless the temperature is high enough, it would not excite. That's right. yeah. But in principle, they could also take away some yeah. information yeah. From, from the photons. Yeah. yeah. So massless particles are probably more effective because at any temperature, there would be more uh, massless particles than massive ones for the reason I mentioned. Right. Right. But uh, in principle, the any kind of particle can move forward. Right. So, so then the, the conclusion is that in terms of gravity, there would be uh, the decoherence in, in case of photons would be highly suppressed. Uh, yes, compared that, to, that's right. Yes. Yes, compared but to if you if you look at quantum mechanics, so they they going to sum over all kinds of all kinds of energies. Right. So here, what we are saying is that when you get to very high energies, probably you don't use the laws of quantum mechanics anymore. At some point, the energy will be so high that you have loss of photons from these kinds of things. Because gravity has uh, gravity has often been invoked to suppress the infinities of quantum field theory, and this might be one way in which those infinities are suppressed. Yeah, but, but, but here charge seems to be the central idea, right? So if you have a neutral massive particle, for instance, yeah. in principle, let's say a self in the Lacan scalar field theory, yes. a massive, then, then again it would be highly suppressed? It so would be highly suppressed, but I'm talking about a matter of principle. No? So if you go to sufficiently high energies, gravity may be as high as electromagnetism is the level. From the experimental point of view, the EM experiments, the charge particle experiments are easier to do. For example, they could do the double slit experiment in the lab, whereas the photon experiment is hopeless in the lab. But my whole philosophy has been, let's construct experiments which can in principle be done, and some of them can be done in practice. So let's do the ones that can be done in practice, and imagine the ones that we can do in principle. <laughs> so that's the multi-micrometer uh, limit you said about, that was for the charge particle. Yeah, that's for the charge particles, for the, for the electron in fact. That's because the uh, that's because the see the temperature of the sun is six thousand degrees centigrade. That emits visible light, and if I reduce the temperature to three hundred, it's a factor of twenty. So the wind wavelength goes up by a factor of twenty. So from one micron to twenty microns. And I check that all the electron experiments are done with a slit separation of around microns. So they could easily increase the slit separation and check quantitatively that this. Uh, that can be done, right? that it, it can be done, it can be done. And check quantitatively that uh, you see this curve in the visibility of the pages. I mean, this is the prediction from the theory by just taking quantum field theory in a, in a temperature bar. And it's an easy calculation. It involves some Lagrange like polynomials and things like that, the kind of things that everybody uses in quantum mechanics courses. But the, the basic thing you would require yes. is a thermal bar yeah. of gravitons yes. or photons. Right, right. So that is very crucial That's to crucial. cause the decoherence. Yes. yes right. So in principle, mm -hmm. if one can isolate your double slit experiment in an environment mm -hmm. yeah. which is protected from a thermal bar, right. there will be no decoherence. There will be no decoherence. But suppose you are in an accelerated frame, then there would be. And suppose you're in the gravitational field, then also they would be, by using the principle of equivalence. But if it's a freely falling uh, uh, no, no, no. experiment in gravitational field. No, if you think of an arbitrary gravitational field, there will be no frame in which there is no thermal bar. No, but, uh, but in case of arbitrary, yes. but isn't the horizon a crucial part of the, of the idea? Yeah. So it, there has to exist a horizon for this to happen. That's right. So in an accelerate, in the rinder frame, there is the horizon. Right. Right. Yeah. But if you take an arbitrary gravitational field, there will be some frames in which you don't have decoherence, but there will be others in which you do have decoherence. So it's a frame dependent motion, depending on in which frame you do the experiment. Yeah. Sorry? So, but you can interpret the experiment in a non-frame, but the reserve. 
but the results, if the results are a photograph that you take, that's an objective fact. But uh, the answer to the experiment can depend on which frame is done. And by the way, those of you who missed the first two lectures, uh, I mean, if there are any students who missed the first two lectures, I understand it's up on YouTube. You can take a look at those. Those are more elementary, and they are basically explaining special relativity and general relativity in a simple manner, starting with thought experiments. I don't know if all of you were here throughout the series. So, yeah. So, the Planck master, uh, there was a kind of uh, yeah. How did you combine this? Yeah, yeah, actually, it's, a, it's entirely a dimensional argument. So, so why not h bar to this? Why not? Why couldn't you have h bar in this because it's continuous? Okay, okay. No, so given that these quantities, g, h bar, and c, you can produce some combinations which have dimensions of length. So I'll show you by a simple argument that uh, what's the which I actually wrote down is the plan. So consider a mass n. I can produce a length by two different ways. One is I can use the relativist's idea. The relativist's idea is to convert everything into geometry. So from this length, I can produce the Schwarzschild radius. So this is one way. 2gm upon c squared is one way. That's called the Schwarzschild radius of the mass. For the Earth, it's one centimeter. For the Sun, it's three kilometers. And in quantum mechanics, I can produce a length like this, h bar over mc. Now if I equate, if I equate these two lengths, which I can do dimensionally, I find that gm over c squared is the same as h bar over mc. And solving for m, I get m squared is equal to h bar c over g to the yeah? Which means that I can take the square root of this, and this turns out to be, in different units, either 10 to the 19 GeV or 10 to the minus 5 grams, depending on the set of units. So what I've done is to produce a dimensional argument for when a black hole Schwarzschild radius is comparable to its Compton wave. That's what, that's the way to derive it. And similarly, you can derive a Planck length by plugging this Planck mass into this formula and a Planck time by multiplying that what you are in that by C. I have, yeah. So what if uh, the observer is piecewise rendered? I mean, you have something with uniform velocity? Yeah, yeah. In it's, the it's minus not, infinity and. Yeah, yeah. I, I really don't know because uh, working out this thing in arbitrary frames is not that easy. Yeah. But I expect there will be lots of coherence. And this, the more generic situation will be that there is uh, loss of coherence. If you're using an arbitrary accelerated motion. I mean, the analog would be in an inertial frame of reference and you're seeing these frames, and then you turn on some acceleration and they disappear. They disappear. That is genuine decoherence of some sort. I mean, it's yeah. actually non unitary Yeah, so you're saying that suppose an observer is uh, first inertial like this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he follows like these lines. Yeah. Then at some point, he starts accelerating like that. Exactly, yeah. I agree with you that at some point, you would have to lose the interference pattern because of the thermal photons which come because of his acceleration. The Minkowski observer, suppose it was an like here, he would say that those extra photons that he's seeing, the loss of the pattern that he's seeing, is because of his acceleration. But is there, is there a genuine horizon in these sort of things? Um, here, here there is, in this situation there is, because he will never be able to see what is over here. To see what is here, you have to stay inertial. And what if we become inertial again? Yeah, then, yeah, that's, I tell you, that, uh, that is uh, an interesting question. It's like so. Yeah. Basically, I mean, what I had in mind was do these sort of horizons.